everyone. Uh, it's great to meet you. Uh, I'm uh, head of gaming, uh, but I've been working in games for about seven years now, uh, starting in League of Legends, uh, moving on to Garena Free Fire, a battle royale with 150 million daily active players, and uh, most recently working in investments, uh, securing a pipeline of new games uh, for my previous company. Um, so very excited to explore and grow the gaming vertical. Uh, cool, so I'm going to jump right in. Uh, so what is our mission for uh, gaming on Tezos? So the most important thing is that we have to be a developer and player-friendly blockchain. We have to be very uh, unlocking new ways to have fun. So we need to be very uh, focused on what the needs are of our key stakeholders, uh, namely the developers that choose to build on us and the players that play the games uh, that are built on us. Uh, this means that uh, vision would be having great games that are built on Tezos that are enjoyed by millions of players. Today, uh, Web2 games have, there are 2 billion gamers worldwide, and the top games tend to have hundreds of millions of players. However, even the top blockchain games only have 100,000 or more daily active users. This means that there's a huge opportunity to grow if we can create great games that leverage the blockchain in an intelligent way. So how do we get millions of players onto the chain? Uh, we're going to set a very clear and simple goal. Uh, we want to maximize the monthly active users on our chain. This is defined as the number of unique wallets that interact with a gaming smart contract every month. And in order to maximize this number, we need to appeal to both game developers and players. On the game developer side, we need to help them to choose Tezos as the chain that they build on. Uh, we may need to have the right branding in place and we need to have uh, enough incentives to, to, to draw them to build on us. We need to make sure they have enough tooling so that they find it easy to integrate Tezos into their game and enable talented Web2 game developers to build Web3 experiences. Finally, uh, we need to ensure that these game developers have funding to get from idea to launch. Understanding that games take on average a million to $5 million to build. Once there are enough great games on Tezos, we need to do two more things to make sure that players are onboarded and stay in our ecosystem. We need to make it seamless for players to start playing, making it brainless to kind of set up a wallet and start create an account and start playing the game. And then when they want to, to top up and monetize as well. We also need strong engagement uh, with a variety of games so that players, once they feel bored of one game, they would be able to transition to other games within the Tezos ecosystem. So let me share a little bit more around the ecosystem of gaming itself. So on the developer side, there are typically three broad categories. The first are AAA developers with billion dollar games and IPs. The second one are venture funded startups with experienced founders. And these founders typically come from AAA developers, uh, but are taking the risk to try something new. Finally, there are creative young teams that create games with very original ideas they might not have as much experience as the previous two categories, but often real innovation can come from here. For example, Among Us is a game created by a small independent studio of three, uh, and to date it has 500 million downloads. On the flip side, there are the players who enjoy these games. Again, I would divide them broadly into three categories. The hardcore players, where gaming is a core part of the identity, and they spend significant amount of time on games. They like games like first-person shooters, like Counter-Strike, multiplayer online battle arenas, like League of Legends or Mobile Legends, and strategy games. To date, there has been quite a lot of negative backlash from the hardcore players around blockchain and crypto because they feel it's another way to monetize them. And uh, we need to change that perception. The second group is casual players. These players do not identify as gamers and only play games when it's convenient and may need to pass the time. They enjoy games like puzzle games, like Candy Crush or Homescapes, idle games and hyper casual games, basically games that are very easy to pick up, learn and play. 
these players are much more open-minded and are willing to experiment and accept the blockchain as long as the barriers to entry are minimal. Finally, there's the crypto players. The primary motivation of these players here are to earn money. Uh, we can further divide them into speculators and earners. The speculators would buy NFTs in order to hope that they appreciate and to earn yield on them, while earners will play the game in order to make a, a, a daily wage. In general, these players tend to be extractive because their motivation is to earn money. So having too many of these would result in an unsustainable ecosystem, but having a few might be worthwhile to kickstart the ecosystem. Now let's jump in to the utility of blockchain for games. So I think this is a very important uh, idea because we need to be able to articulate to partners, especially Web2 partners, around how exactly they should use the blockchain you know, in, in, in their businesses, in their successful existing businesses. And this list is not meant to be exhaustive, but really as a starting point for you to think of what other use cases there could be. So the first use case is real money gaming, betting money on yourself that you would win a competitive game. These games can be simple, casual PVP games like Agar, Sliver, or Solitaire, or even more hardcore ones like Battle Royale strategy games. The incumbent Web2 competitor in the space, Skills, and as well as a Web3 competitor called Mobile Premier League, have uh, substantial funding and valuations, but there is still much more that can be done to challenge their lead. The other way that we can use the blockchain is by rewarding contributors for the game itself. Today, in, the, in games like Roblox, Roblox does not have any self-developed games. All they provide is a studio and a development tool that other players can create experiences on. They are able to grow to a $20 billion company because players love creating experiences for other players. If we're able to really align incentives using NFTs and tokens to incentivize these creators and reward them for creating engaging experiences, uh, that's going to be an incredibly powerful force. The second one would, oh, that's closely tied to that is also rewarding the community. The idea being that if you reward the first players in your game, they will be incentivized to promote it and grow the community, which increases the value of the tokens and NFTs that they hold. So this creates a very organic and native marketing campaign uh, and is, is incredibly effective in getting the game out to more players. There's also an idea around funding innovation. So right now, the, most of the funding for Web2 games comes from VCs and publishers, and those tend to be very safe and risk adverse. There is a potential for a Kickstarter with a financial upside by having more game-focused launch pads, and this creates a, a more funding within our ecosystem as well, resulting in better games. Finally, uh, there's the idea around direct user acquisition. So today it costs between $5 to $10 to acquire one player uh, for Homescapes and Candy Crush in, uh, in, in, in the US. And the goal here is that instead of paying a huge amount of money to Facebook or Google, we can airdrop these rewards directly to our players and get, convince them to try out the game. A few other use cases. So there's also an idea around unified gamer identities, having a single wallet that accesses all your games and holds all, uh, all your information from your achievements to the game licenses that you bought, as well to as your in-game currency and all the digital items that you have acquired. Having a single account will make it very simple for players to log in uh, to whatever new game they want to try. At the same time, it also allows for interoperability where other companies can read what's on your wallet and provide you with certain rewards based on that. For example, if you have a great uh, skin or a high rank in League of Legends uh, and that information is on your wallet on the blockchain, uh, other companies like Twitter or Reddit could provide you digital rewards like unique profiles and companies like Nike could even have physical rewards or physical merchandise that's exclusive to holders of these NFTs. 
There's also the idea around digital ownership. Uh, so right now, the narrative is that this and the NFTs enable true ownership of your digital assets. But very practically, it means that players are allowed and enabled to trade and gift what they have already bought. This means that they are more willing to spend for items because they know that they can be resold. Ultimately, this will lead to a player-driven economy where players actually determine the value of digital items, enabling better price discrimination. At the same time, there are also potentially recurring revenues from trading fees. This could also ultimately re result in huge on-chain economies, especially for strategy games. Two other use cases. One is around the unique items. So right now, all swords are equivalent in a game. However, if you make each of them NFTs, they each become unique and each have a unique history and provenance. And so each of these, uh, uh, and so for example, there is 100,000 basketballs in the world, but only one basketball was used by Michael Jordan in the 1998 championships. In the same way, there would be rare skins that were used by professional players in world championships. Finally, there are grassroots tournaments. Uh, basically, we can expect smart contract escrow to ensure that prize pools are paid out for smaller scale tournaments, where this is often a problem where the organizers, organizers renege on their payments. So I'll jump in to uh, share a little bit more about where we are. Uh, so uh, today, today, we have been securing partnerships with AAA developers like Ubisoft. We have ambitious startups like Dogami, key infrastructure tools like the game engine Unity, uh, as well as globally recognized esports teams uh, like Vitality and accelerators and launch pads like Blockborn. So our vision, to remind everyone again before I jump into the strategy for next year, is that our vision is for great games built on Tezos enjoyed by millions of players. So how do we get there? How do we get great games and how do we get millions of players? Let's think about great games first. We need the right developer branding. Today, when a Web2 developer or game developer thinks about building a game, they do not think of Tezos as one of the options. Typically, it's Polygon, Solana, potentially IMAX, maybe AVAX. We need to get into the consideration set by having stronger branding and emphasizing that we're easy to build on with a white label Unity solution and that we're trusted by AAA developers like Ubisoft. We need to really market to these developers through the channels which they are familiar with, word of mouth channels like developer networks and studio advisors and industry networks like uh, uh, industry industry Slack channels. This will not, this Marketing through broad-based marketing efforts will not be as effective because our target audience here is not players. It's developers, people who build games. Then once they, are, they consider Tezos, we need to make it very easy and optimal for them to onboard. We need to have the right tools, well-designed and all in one place in the Tezos Games Kit. We need to have strong developer su support communities and we need to have white glove service for high potential partners. Many of our competitors are running around signing thousands of deals. I don't think that's smart because at the end of the day, you need to work closely with partners in order to integrate the blockchain meaningfully and successfully. Our strategy would be much more selective, but we would pick a few partners uh, relative to the rest. It'll still be quite a lot, uh, but it would be a, a very sensible number that we can effectively support and make sure that each of these partners have a reasonable chance of success. Finally, there's an idea, uh, idea to launch support. So beyond uh, the AAA developers and the VC-backed startups, there are the independent developers and people who have great ideas. And we want to enable them to bring that idea all the way from, from, from an idea to a full game launch. This means that they have, there have to be enough hackathons for them to join so that they can actually flesh out their idea and have a rough prototype. They need to have incubators and accelerators to help them you know, refine the product market fit and actually get a polished uh, prototype out. And finally, bring uh, more VCs and launch pads into the ecosystem uh, in order to fund the best projects that result from this process uh, and get them to launch. Very practically, what that means is that we also need to kickstart the ecosystem. So today, there are only very few uh, players on Tezos. Uh, combined, our games only have around 300 daily active users. 
we need to solve this and kickstart the e ecosystem uh, by launching a, a, a casual PvP platform. So this platform will have very simple games but will ID and allow players to wager on themselves using Tez. This should ideally attract 10 to 20,000 monthly active users, which should see our chain usage increase to reasonable numbers to the point where we become a chain of consideration. We also need to focus on capital funding efficiency, where every dollar that we spend, the goal is that it translates into $10 or more of funding uh, for, the, for the studio and the developer that we're funding. This means that we need to co-invest with VCs and publishers and get them to uh, see the value and potential of, of our investments and our grantees and keep them uh, invested in future rounds. We can also leverage launch pads and by drawing in more retail investors. And finally, we can also be capital efficient by investing in low-cost emerging market teams, as well as capital efficient genres. That's it. We also do need to make some calculated investments, large-scale ones, where we have to be incredibly selective, where we only invest in 1% or less of all the deals that we see. We need to be super certain about these because uh, you know, they, they are expensive. And we need to be also be as efficient as possible by having high high investment multiplier. The genres that have the potential to attract hundreds of millions of players and billions of annual revenue tend to be multiplayer, massive multiplayer online games, first person like World of Warcraft, first person shooters like Counter Strike and Overwatch, game creation tools like Roblox and Minecraft, and strategy games like Starcraft and Clash Royale and Clash of Clans. So these games are typically very expensive to make, the cheapest of which would cost between 5 to 10 million and on average easily 25 to 50 million. So this means that even if we're able to achieve strong multiples, uh, we would still need to invest a considerable amount. But it is worth it because one successful game in this genre that's built on Tezos will cement us as a leading blockchain. So now let's uh, shift over from games to, the, to players. So I think there's a few things that are important. Firstly, right now, the new user experience is not good for players. We need to make sure that starting to play a game is as simple as possible and needs to be as easy to do as it is currently today for non-Web3 games, for free-to-play games. We need to have free-to-play options for the games on our platforms so that players are able to try out the game and enjoy it before they are asked to make purchases. We need to improve the onboarding, so uh, not, not uh, Solutions like Kukai and Bet, for example, are great uh, solutions for this, where you know you don't have to record down twenty or thirty words. All you have to do is to log in using your social accounts, social media accounts, or Google accounts. There needs to be more seamless payment options. I think MoonPay being a, a prime example of what's successful, and finally having more intuitive NFT marketplaces. On the blockchain-enabled fun aspect, I went through most of these in the use cases. I just want to highlight community and creators. On the community side, I think there's a big use case around where fans actually can fund the development of the game in exchange for membership. And they feel a good sense of belonging, but they also are rewarded uh, when the value of their memberships increase in price because the game becomes more popular uh, and more and more people want the, the privilege of, of that those memberships offer. Uh, finally, there's also the idea around creators. So the top games in Web2 today, those with hundreds of millions of players, most of them actually come from mods or, or basically people taking an existing game and modifying it into something new. League of Legends came from a mod called Defense of the Ancients, which was a mod of World of, of, of Warcraft 3. Player Unknown Battlegrounds, the top battle royale in the world, came from a mod of a, another game called Armor 3. So this is incredibly common. And by enabling creators to be rewarded for their efforts, this would actually uh, help them to create more, incentivize them to create more, and hopefully result in more innovation throughout the entire gaming ecosystem. So conclusion, I think that really the objective for 2023 and what I really want to emphasize and hammer in is that the objective for gaming on Tezos is to maximize the monthly active users. We have one metric, and we just need to keep thinking about it whenever we are spending time or money uh, in our day-to-day -day jobs. When we look at a partner, when we look at an integration, when we look at an investment opportunity, 
you need to think at the end of the day, once we sign this deal, once we once we support them, how many players does that get us? How many players will be interacting with Tezos uh, and will be interacting with our smart contracts? I think that would, is, a, is, a, is an easy way uh, and a good way to think about how we're spending our time to make sure that it drives many, many more users onto our chain. The way that we do this is uh, uh, really having a deep understanding of developers and players. We need to constantly test our assumptions. We need to talk to developers, talk to players constantly. We need to make sure that we, again, we, we truly empathize and understand what's important to them and not just assume that we know what they want. Uh, we need to build the tools and processes so that it's easy and, uh, for them to, to start building on us. We need to kickstart the ecosystem because ultimately, you know, everyone talks about the chicken and egg, but we need to kind of break the cycle by, you know, I don't know, laying an egg. Right, which is getting doing a white label thing, getting ten thousand users on board, twenty thousand users on board, and that would kind of kickstart the flywheel of more games and more players. Uh, so I hope this has been helpful. Uh, I'm really excited to to start on this journey. I'm really excited to grow this vertical. I hope you'll join me on the journey. See you.